Great. Fabulous. Okay, without further ado, I will hand over to Liz and Helen. Good evening, everybody, um, and very many thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I've been a GP for 36 years in Chelmsford. Um, I've also been a Macmillan GP for 15 years, and I'm what they call the system clinical lead for cancer in Mid and South Essex. Um, so I've been in and out of cancer services a lot um, with a professional hat on, but also have had very close family members go through cancer pathways. So very close family members. So I, I, I think, I hope I bring not only a health professional hat, but also a personal hat as well. Um, so um, Helen, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Helen Cannon. Um, I live in Suffolk. Um, I'm um, on, I'm 40 now, but I was diagnosed with um, stage four advanced um, colorectal cancer um, at the age of 38 two years ago. Um, and um, I had to give up my career as a secondary science teacher as a result of that. Um, thankfully, the um, initial prognosis of nine months was completely wrong and I'm still here and able to to do this today. Thanks, Helen. Um, I think Jane's going to very kindly share my slides for me. So, next one, thank you, Jane. So I thought it was quite important to sort of say, just as a way of introduction, how the story of cancer has really changed um, and how much better outcomes are because of more sophisticated treatment. So if you look at this um, uh, first slide, and this is lifted from Macmillan, back in 1970, if you were diagnosed with cancer, you your average survival was a year. If you move on to 2015, average survival is 10 years and so it goes on and improves and cancer is still thought of as that um, diagnosis where it's going to be a poor outcome but it really isn't obviously the earlier we diagnose your cancer the better but even people with late stage cancers with modern treatments can undergo treatment sessions um, and actually live with their cancer and die with it and not from it. And I think, you know, I want to get the message out that cancer is a long term condition now, but it is still that diagnosis that everybody fears. And I think because of that, there have been lots of campaigns to encourage people to come forward so we get an earlier diagnosis, but also to talk about their, their, their symptoms. So we have the next slide, Jane. So these are the awareness campaigns, and some of you have probably seen them. So the national ones, which is Be Clear on Cancer, and you may have seen them where, you know, somebody's looking in the loo and he's doing a wee and he's looking a bit quizzical because he's got some blood in his urine, and then you, he goes and talks to somebody else. And again, that was very much to get people to realise that that's, that's a symptom that needs discussing. It could be a sign of cancer, but equally it may not be. Um, back in the day, and some of us, probably Ray, I would think, um, on this call will have been involved with the old Essex Cancer Network. Oh, it may not be because I don't think Ray's in Essex, but the, there were cancer networks and we did a um, awareness campaign for lung cancer and we called it Get It Off Your Chest. And that, again, was to encourage people to come forward with persisting coughs if they were a smoker, if they were over 50. And we targeted that campaign to areas where we knew there was a high incidence of lung cancer. And that was really interestingly targeted, not only at the public, um, and there were billboards and things on the back of buses and everything, but it was also targeted at GPs, so that GPs referred much earlier. Um, and in Mid and South Essex, and I'll talk about this later, um, we have an ABCD campaign to again inform people about some of those signs and symptoms that could mean that you have cancer, or at least means that you ought to go and discuss them with your GP. Next slide, please. I think the key thing that I need to get across to all of you is knowing your body. So if something doesn't feel right for you or look right or you have any worries that you might have cancer, don't ignore it. 
whether it's a new change, it's unusual for you, or something that won't go away, get it checked out. In most cases, it won't be cancer, but if it is, spotting early is important. So it's really important to listen to and know your body. And as a GP, I often have people say, have said to me, but it, this, this is unusual for me. And you need to get your GP to listen to that. And the more you know your body, it's a bit like breast awareness, isn't it? Knowing how to examine your breast. It's like a testicular cancer, you know, men to examine their testes so they know what is normal for them. Next slide. Thank you, Jane. So this is the um, uh, programme we have in Mid and South Essex, and there are some links there so you can look at them. And we thought it was um, uh, an easy way for people to think about A, B, C, D, E. Um, and this has been ratified by Macmillan and the experts. So these are very general symptoms that potentially may be concerning of a cancer diagnosis. So appetite loss. Have you gone off your food without there being any explanation? Are you losing weight without trying? Blood. Um, so blood in the in your poo, we I think most of us know that that's a bit of a warning sign, but of course it can be something sim simple like piles, for example. But if blood is in your, you need to ask about it. If you have blood in your urine, you should be questioning it. Often blood in the urine is a sign of infection, but it can be a sign of something a bit more serious. And for women, if it's irregular menstrual bleeding, check it out. And certainly if you've gone through the menopause and you're a year after your, men, your, your period stop and you start to get bleeding, get it checked out. Cough. So persistent cough, particularly if you're a smoker and over the age of 50, and although that says six weeks, I'll have to amend these slides because really we would say after three weeks, you need to go and see your GP. And I think again, and we'll probably come on to this later, if you know the GP decides that it's probably a chest infection and gives you some antibiotics, but cough doesn't settle, then go back. Pain or different and discomfort. Pain is something that we all experience um, and often it's transitory. You know, you wake up with a headache. But if pain is persisting wherever it is in your body, particularly if it's waking you up at night and you can't explain it, then that needs checking out. Um, and those sort of feelings of being really fatigued, tired and exhausted. And I think all of us have busy lives. Sometimes we don't sleep well. We sometimes rationalise and we, we sort of think, well, it must be because of this. And we reassure ourselves. But if it's persisting and really you can't explain it, get it checked out. Um, and it, as you see at the bottom, it says, please speak to your GP if you notice something unusual for you. I'm just going to do a few of the specific ones. So, again, you can access these. Um, so breast cancer. It's interesting with breast cancer because a lot of women will think, Pain is a sign of breast cancer. Actually, it's one of the lowest signs of breast cancer. You can get pain, but most breast pain is actually due to hormonal changes, particularly if it's both breasts. But again, if it's something which is different and it's persisting, get it checked out. Obviously, looking at your breast, and when we talk about breast awareness, um, it is difficult to examine breasts because breasts quite lumpy things anyway um but knowing your breast and knowing what is normal for you is is important sometimes you can get skin changes with breast cancer and and we talk about a peur d'orange so it's a bit like uh, the orange skin which is all a bit dimply that's definitely something you should get your doctor to have a look at or if you get a rash around the nipple. Sometimes it can be simple eczema because you washed your bra in, you know, biological detergent. But sometimes it can be that you've got one of the rarer um, uh, signs of breast cancer. So it's those things to be aware of. I think most women will know that if they've got a lump in their breast, that needs checking out. Um, new lumps, lumps, or you can feel something in your armpit. Again, go to your doctor. 
and changes in the nipple. So I've talked about the skin around the nipple, but blood stain discharge, particularly if it's from one breast, is something that should be discussed. For most women, um, particularly before your menopause, if you massage your breasts vigorously, you will get some nipple discharge. And actually, when we've done breast awareness campaigns, sometimes it's caused a flurry of women who are examining their breasts so much, they're actually um, causing some nipple discharge. But again, if you're not if you're not certain, seek help. Um, and I think I've said about the the, the pain being actually quite a uh, uh, not a, not an unimportant sign, but one which doesn't actually feature very much in breast cancer. Next slide, Jane. And bowel cancer. Um, now, a lot of you will have already done your bowel screening, I hope. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but bowel cancer is something where um, blood in the poo is important. Abdominal pain is important. If you're, you've started to lose weight for no particular reason, um, change in bowel habit, that's interesting because change in bowel habit, most of us will experience our bowels suddenly, you know, not being quite right. So it can be, you know, if you've been out for an Indian or you've eat something which is a bit dodgy or you've been abroad or I see Helen's smiling at that so obviously there's been some experience there um, so um, a change in bowel habit can be transitory I know myself if I get anxious about something my bowels go a bit haywire but if it's persisting and certainly if there are other symptoms get it checked out and I'm going back to the bowel screening if any of you have undertaken the bowel screening, you're sent a little kit in the post with a little stick and you put the stick in your poo and you put it back in the little bottle and you send it off in the post. So that's called a fit test. And what it does is it detects blood in your poo. Now, that's for screening, but actually fit and it's the same test but it works in a, a, a slightly different way because it's a different number of a, a cutoff because it's a, what we call a, a quantitative test so we have a certain screening number and we have a different number if we want to exclude bowel cancer as a diagnosis and it's highly sensitive um, and very very specific for checking blood in the poo so if you had a change in bowel habit and you went to your doctor and they examined you and they sent you off for a fit test and gave you that little pop and the fit came back as negative, the chances of you having bowel cancer would be 0.01%, same as the general population. So it's hugely reassuring. If you had other symptoms, then you would still need to be um uh, examined and investigated for that. But just to say that changing bowel habit with no other concerning symptoms and a, a fit test that's negative is hugely reassuring. Um, next, next slide, Jane. Thank you. Um, and I thought I'd put prostate and testicular cancer. I said about, you know, men examining their testes. I think women have always been encouraged to examine their breasts, um, but men tend to be less or a bit more reticent in examining themselves. But again, really important that if you find a lump in your testes. Um, prostate cancer, this is a really difficult one because symptoms of prostate cancer can also mimic prostate problems that men develop as they get older. So getting up in the middle of the night to do a wee or um, having going to the loo more frequently or having difficulty with your stream, they can all be um, signs of an enlarging prostate as men get older. But if it doesn't seem right, again, check it with your doctor. Um, certainly, if there's any blood in your way, you should be getting that checked out. Um, and also, there is something about if you suddenly have some sexual difficulties and you're not being able to maintain an erection, that can be a sign of, of prostate cancer. Um, next slide, please. 
and skin cancer. Um, so here we go, the ABCD. I, I've gone off script a bit, but asymmetry. So does your mole look symmetrical in appearance? If you look at that first picture, it's not quite the same, is it, all the way through? Is the border of that mole irregular? Does it look jagged? Has there been a change in the colour? Is it is it is there more um, black in that mole than there used to be? And does your mole look larger than a pencil eraser? So do those little rubbers that the end have on the end of a pencil? And and has your mole suddenly changed? So again, all of those things be aware of. Next slide, please. So just before we go to this video, I thought we, we've got some videos and there's a link there that you can access. I just say that there are some basic symptoms. So it's unexplained pain, unexplained bleeding, unexplained bowel habit, unexplained changes for you. Sometimes your symptoms can be quite vague. You know, we've talked about fatigue and tiredness and us GPs, sometimes we struggle because we think it might be cancer, but it doesn't quite fit in any of the agreed pathways. So if we refer you on a cancer pathway for an urgent cancer referral, we have various forms we would fill out, one for bowel, one for breast, one for lung, etc. Sometimes you don't quite fit into that. So we have got um, in your area across the east of England, what we call, we used to call it the vague symptom pathway. It's now called non-site specific pathway, but a vague symptom pathway is exactly for those patients who us GPs are worried about, but we can't fit them into one of those, those, those cancer forms. Um, and what normally happens, and certainly I can talk about it in Mid and South Essex, is that you would be asked to do some tests by your GP, blood tests and a chest X-ray, you, that would be then received in the hospital. It would a nurse would look at that, and then in discussion with a GP, um, I'm the GP that's involved with that in Mid and South Essex, um, and some consultants. We would then see that you probably needed a CT scan, and that would be of your chest and abdo abdomen, and in your pelvis as well. And then with those results, we have an MDT. That's a multidisciplinary team meeting once a week and we look at all of that and hopefully exclude cancer. So just to tell you, you can ask a GP, if the GP says, oh, well, it's not going to be bowel cancer, it's not going to be that, you can actually say, I hear there's a vague symptom pathway, doctor. What about that as a referral? So, so Jane's now going to run this video. These were videos that linked in with the ABCD campaign. Um, and the one we're going to show you is the breast cancer one. Um, and uh, Ria, the young doctor who delivers it, actually was our GP registrar at my surgery. Um, but, but if Jane's managed the IT, the tech bit, here we go. Oh, the video isn't showing, Jane. Oh, Hello, yes. my name is Dr. Ria Ramin, and I have an important message for you about breast cancer. If you're worried about any signs or symptoms that you may be experiencing, that you think could be breast cancer, it's really important that you speak to your GP as early as possible. Symptoms to look out for include A. Appearance. Do your breasts look or feel different? Do you look or feel like you've lost weight without trying to? B. Bump. Do you have any new lumps or bumps with or without pain in your breast or armpits? C. Changes to the nipple. Does your nipple look different or has any liquid been coming out of the nipple? D. Discomfort. Do you have any pain in your breast that does not go away? Usually, the chances are this isn't cancer and it won't be serious, but it's important to find cancer early so treatment can start sooner and there's a better chance of being cured. The earlier breast cancer is diagnosed and treated, the more successful treatment is likely to be. Please do not hesitate to speak to your GP if you notice something that's unusual for you. The NHS is here to help you get the care you need. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for sharing that. And um, I'll just go back to the, I've just got a couple more slides. I think Jane will get that back up. 
Can I quickly just say, just to be aware, any latecomers, um, we are recording this section. So if you have your camera on, please be aware that you will be recorded um, and it may be used for future use. Is there a um, way so you, if you can don't want to do be breast recorded. cancer without chemotherapy? Absolutely. In fact, many. That's oh. my tea. Here we, um, I think there's one before that. Is there or have I put it in the wrong order? OK, so OK, so I, I thought I would just remind everybody, um, you know, GP surgeries now um, are more than just GPs and nurses. So we talk about GP surgeries, primary care and primary care networks and the workforce um, it to, to help you doesn't. Um, just involve GP and nurses. There's allied health care professionals, care navigators, receptionists, social prescribers. And I know how difficult it is for people to get to see their GP. Uh, I, I hear about it, the access to primary care. But if you can't get to see a GP, actually these people that I've listed there are there to help you and if you say look I am worried to your nurse that these symptoms may be cancer she can actually a lot of can, um, uh, practice nurses are trained in cancer care um, and care navigators and receptionists they are now trained they're not just there to say you can't have an appointment you need to say I'm concerned I might have cancer because that's a way of triaging social prescribers are a wonderful group of people who really help with all aspects of cancer care and we are developing educational modules for them so that they can be really supportive for, for all of you. And, and, and everyone can help you. Next slide, Jane. So how do I let my health professional know my concerns? It's difficult, isn't it? Because sometimes you get in front of a doctor or a health professional and, and, and you, you, you lose what you're going to say. Um, I know myself, you know, for sitting in front of a consultant, I, I think, you know, what am I going to say? So be prepared. Write things down if it helps. Um, you know, far better so that you can feel confident in what you want to tell them. Be thorough and make sure that they let you speak. Um, because sometimes um, we can rush in and cut you off because we want to find out a little bit more about something. But make sure that you you actually tell them all the things that you want to. And be honest, don't feel embarrassed that you've got these symptoms. Can I tell them that? Can I ask them? What will he say if I say this? I, I, I tell you, there would be nothing that us GPs would be surprised to hear. But don't sometimes in our efforts, because we don't want to believe we might have cancer, we almost collude with ourselves and pretend it probably is that I won't tell him that. Be honest. And the absolute clear message today is if your symptoms persist, go back. If you feel you've been given some advice, you've gone away, you've done it, um, hopefully you'd have been given a sort of time interval of when the GP thinks your symptoms might resolve. If they don't, go back. Nobody's going to think you're a nuisance. We need to see you and we need to make sure that we are listening to you and actually reassure you appropriately. Um, and it may mean that you need some investigations and diagnostics, but go back if you're not happy. Now, I'm going to hand over to Helen to tell her story. Hi there. Um Jane, would it be possible to have up um, Liz's slide um, about the symptoms of bowel cancer while I'm doing this, please? So um, just as an um, introduction for those of you that came late, um, I'm Helen Canning. Um, I'm now 40, but um, at the age of 38, so two years ago, 
I was diagnosed with um, colorectal cancer. Um, it's stage four, um, very advanced, um, and I was only given nine months to live. Um, so what I really want to talk about today, obviously the nine months was wrong because I'm still here doing this, um, but um, <laughs> that's a whole other story. Um, what I really want to talk about today is how I got to that diagnosis and the role that, that my GP played in that. So um, a little bit of background, I've got two daughters. Um, in between having those two daughters, I had a um, an ovarian cyst removed um, that they discovered during the birth of my first daughter. Um, I'd had complications. I ended up having a cesarean. During the cesarean, they found this, um, this ovarian cyst um, with it being a... Um, an emergency, a very emergency caesarean. They weren't prepared to, to do the operation there and then, so I had to wait a few months. Had the cyst removed, non-cancerous, and everything was presumed fine. Um, that was until I had my second daughter. Oh, have we lost Helen? Yeah. Helen, if you can hear us, you've frozen, we can't hear you. Oh no, it's all going so well. Yeah, I think she's frozen entirely. Jane can. Ah, oh, brilliant. Here. Yeah. Can you see me? Again? Hi, Helen. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You completely froze. Okay. Um. Yeah. Is that okay? I could. I could. I could still see everybody. So I don't really know what happened there. Sorry. No. Um. No problem. Anyway. Um. So. Um. Yeah. So. Once I'd had both my daughters. Um. I was kind of. I, I had a gynecologist that, that was kind of on watch for me um, and it was, I'd say sort of at the start of the first lockdown, I started getting a very, very similar discomfort. I can't call it a pain because it wasn't, it was just a discomfort um, that was very similar to when I'd had the ovarian cyst. Um, so with it being covid lockdown and all the rest of it called my gp and she was like look there's no point in you coming to see me and doing all x y and z i'm just going to send you straight to the gynecologist because i we've lost you again Hello, it you. sometimes helps if you turn off your camera and just uh, rely on your voice. That reduces the bandwidth. So that's a problem. Have you still got your mic on, Helen? Because I can't hear anything. Yes, yes, I have. Ah, brilliant. Oh, we can hear yeah. you again. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why bandwidth would be a problem because we've got like super fast broadband. So I, I guess it's a problem somewhere else. Um, but yeah, so um, I'll, I'll leave the camera off and see if we can do it that way. Um, yeah. So when my gynecologist couldn't find anything else, um, she referred me back to my GP. With it being COVID, this took a very long time. During that time, I get I started getting insanely tired. And I'm not talking sleepy. I am talking exhausted beyond all reason. Um, I did COVID tests because I was a teacher. I was COVID testing um, twice a week, um, even though we weren't going into work. Um, and um, so I'm not quite sure how that would affect my online lessons, but I still had to prove I was... I was going twice a week, so I was being tested twice a week. Absolutely no COVID. And 
I, I then started gaining weight, not losing weight, but gaining weight with absolutely no explanation. Um, it was at this point, um, this was then, um, this, this was sort of April 21, so we were kind of coming out of COVID by this point. Um, this was when I went to go see the gynaecologist again for something totally different um, and we were having a little conversation and I mentioned feeling really tired. Um, I said, I just made a flyaway comment of, oh, <laughs> the vomiting doesn't help either. And she went, oh, no, this needs to go back to your GP. This has nothing to do with me. So I had made an appointment with my GP to discuss this. Um, she did a blood test. She found that I was anemic. Um, and was in the process of um, speaking to her MDT, which, um, as Liz mentioned, is the multidisciplinary team meeting to see what she could do with a late 30s female patient who was tired beyond all reason and was anemic. What, what were the next stages? Um, so my GP was doing all, all the right things, sadly not quick enough, though, um, because it was at that point I um, I was then admitted to A&E with severe pains. Um, and that's where I received my diagnosis. So I'd not had any of your classic kind of symptoms. I'd not had the weight loss. I had weight gain. Um, I'd not had the bleeding. Um, on reflection, I had had the changes in bowel habits but because it had come on over such a long period of time and was post two childbirths um i kind of assumed as did my gp that the changes were to do with that um and as i say the discomfort was was being investigated but um it turned out that they were actually looking on the wrong side the discomfort on the left was because i had a massive tumor on the right hand side so yeah, um, but my GP was doing doing the right things at the time. Um, I met up with a friend today um, and she's at the same GP surgery I am. And I was really pleased for her and pleased for the other patients at my GP surgery to learn that she had gone with similar symptoms to what I had. It's quite clear she doesn't have bowel cancer. Um, but my GP um, surgery have, amongst other tests, given her a fit test to do straight off the bat. So I I'm only one patient. It's quite a large GP practice, yet they are now, because of the thing that happened to me, testing everybody. And I think that's a, a brilliant outcome um, to happen. Um, and yeah, so that that's kind of how I how I became diagnosed. That's how I got to where I was um, and the role that my GP played in it. Um, post diagnosis, my GP, again, has been absolutely fantastic. They ring me once a month. Hi, how are you doing? And just sort of check in. Um, and um, yeah, they've they've been fab. I think that potentially if it hadn't been COVID and it hadn't been locked down, I would have been diagnosed sooner. But we shall never know. Um, it's just one of those things. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, and thank you, Liz, as well. Um, the two of you um, are now going to have a discussion, so I'll, I'll hand straight back to you. Yes, yeah, that, thanks, um, Helen. That's the sort of second time I, I've heard your story. So it's really interesting, isn't it? So you picked up some of those things, haven't you, where you almost rationalised to yourself why you may be tired or why you might have pain. Um, do you feel when you saw your GP, and of course it was difficult, as you said, because it was COVID, um, did you feel able to say, can I come and see you or should I be examined or does it feel the same as when you had your ovarian cyst? Whether there, did you feel able to ask some of those questions, do you think? Um no, I didn't, um, is the plain answer. And it wasn't anything that my GP had done wrong. It was just quite simply that it was a time where we were told to stay away from as many people as possible. Um, and, um, you know, there were messages out there saying, unless it is an absolute emergency, don't contact the NHS, don't bother them, they're busy. And my my actual assigned GP, our family doctor, and um, she had been um, reassigned back to the um, our local hospital. So I knew she wasn't around. So I think that did play a, a big part. You know, sort of my hesitance was as much a reason for the delay. OK, 
And, and and again, when you you mentioned about when you were found to be a name, it's interesting, isn't it? The gynecologist you saw, did she suggest that she would organise the blood test for you, or was yeah, it yes, it was straight back it to was, the GP? It was her that suggested the blood test, but it was my GP that had to sign it over and organise it um, because. Um, it wasn't anything directly gynecological. And again, as I say, we were coming out of COVID at the time. Um, so everything was very much by the book and there wasn't a case of, oh, I'll, I'll just let that one go through. She had to follow procedure. So it was my GP that that in the end had ordered that. OK, because I, I think, again, I mean, obviously COVID, it, we had sort of different ways of managing things. But uh, again, I think sometimes patients ping pong backwards and forwards between the hospital and yes. primary care. And and in my book, you know, if, if you as a clinician, whether you're a gynecologist, colorectal surgeon or GP, think somebody needs a blood test, then organise it. Because yes. often you, by sending them back to somebody, backwards and forwards, you build in those delays. And not that that would have made any difference, it perhaps might have saved you having to go up to A&E but I think that again is important to be able to say to whoever's in front of you can you organise that for me doctor? Yes um, definitely yeah um, I mean I did ask her at the time I said is this something that you could personally um, sort out and she said at the moment the way that procedures are working no but ordinarily I would do. Okay so that's that's reassuring that that's what you were able to say that because that's really important isn't it that you felt and perhaps you had that relationship with the gynaecologist? Yes. Um, it, strangely, I, I also know her on a personal level. It's, it's a large hospital, but a small town. So I do also <laughs> know her, um, which, which helped. Um, but um, I think sort of my my kind of overriding message to everybody is we are done with COVID now. And although procedures to a certain extent have changed, we are also back to normal. And normal means that you can approach your GP. You can get through that barrier that some people see of the receptionist. There are key things that you can say to a receptionist that means that you get either, whether it's a callback or an in-person appointment, there are key things you can say to receptionists where they go, actually, no, this person does need to speak to their GP. 100%, Helen, absolutely. And and just coming back to that little bit where you said about your GP discussed it at MDT. So what was what was happening there at that time when you had been found that you were anemic? Um, so um, it was to get me away from the gynecological pathway, basically, um, because obviously the investigation had been done. I'd had um, an ultrasound. I'd had the blood test. Um, I'd had a couple of other physical examinations as well. Um, and it was shown to be nothing gynecological. Um, and so, of course, a, a young woman, they always say, first sign of anemia, how are your periods? Which is a great thing to ask. But all my questions gynecologically wise had come back as she's boringly normal. Um, so the MDT that that my GP was going to was to get me away from that gynecological pathway and, and, and get me elsewhere. OK. And and I think you mentioned your friend today. So so were you offered a fit test when you had that blood test, the result? The, the no, I wasn't. Thing? I okay. wasn't. Um, okay. This is something that um, I know is being looked at by a lot of different people, a lot of different organisations, is that at the moment, fit tests as standard procedure um, are not issued to the under 50s. In some areas, it's under 55 still. Um, so as somebody in their 30s, it wasn't kind of the automatic thought to, to give me one. However, as I say with my friend, she's she's 34 um, and she was given one today. It seems to be that that my particular GP surgery have gone noodles to regulations. We've had this patient. We need to start doing this. So it, it seems to be that they have changed their standard procedure now. And hopefully other GP surgeries will follow suit very soon. Absolutely. And, 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 and being young doesn't mean that you don't get bowel cancer. Exactly. Being young doesn't yeah. mean you get any of the cancers. Yeah, um, I mean, and, th and there's, I, there's a whole organisation that I didn't realise that's an offshoot of um, Bowel Cancer UK, which is called Never Too Young. Um, and 
at the age of 40, I'm considered one of the older members. Um, you know, I'm, I'm classed as a senior in that group. Um, and sadly, there, there are a lot of late 20s, early 30s. Um, we've even got one member who's 18. Um, so there isn't such thing as never as being too young um, for bowel cancer. It's just too young for it to be common. Absolutely, Helen. Sorry, sorry to come in. Um, yeah, um, thank you for such a brilliant discussion. Um, and um, yeah, you're totally right, Helen. I was diagnosed with bowel cancer at 23, so you really are never yeah. too young. Um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. That was such a brilliant That's discussion, fine. but I think Thanks we're going to have to move on to questions. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to 